Uh, so warning, I am not politically correct, gentle, interested in feelings, or going to treat any of you here with kid gloves. Okay, this is just a direct, Spirit. frank conversation. Yeah. Just lie down. But what I am is I am direct, to the point, blunt, and I'm here to make sure that you all receive value out of this conversation. So, lost your mom. This is my this is one of my personal favorite slides. Legal stuff. Because lawyers got way too much free time on their hands. So this is nothing that's guaranteed to save your life. Straight up. This will be this will not be a magic bullet that's going to ensure anything for anybody under any circumstances. This is simply a series of thoughts to get you thinking about what you about what you need for your unique circumstances. You're going to need to determine how or what and or even who is needed in your unique circumstances. And I'm definitely not going to tell you if you should or should not use physical force of any kind in any situation. That's between you, your God, and the law. And that's entirely up to you guys. We'll discuss that more later. So the intentions today. This is not going to be a lecture or a seminar, even though we're getting some of this administrative stuff out of the way at the beginning, is it, or a class or just a speech from me. In fact, I'm going to feel real stupid if it is. Uh, this is a conversation, it's a, a dialogue about a get-home bag and our unique circumstances. Because Texas is unique, we all know that. And our, everywhere everybody lives is unique. And we'll get into the fact that if you live in New York, you've got one set of requirements. If you live in Maine, you've got another. But in Texas, you've got a whole other set of requirements for even in Florida. So we'll talk about that as well later. So first of all, let's talk about why we're doing this. We're all doing this to be prepared for emergencies of some kind. So these are some of the self-defined reasons that people prepare. So personally, I mine's the EMP thing. Okay, electromagnetic pulse shuts down all electronics in the continental United States in the blink of an eye. Um, our society is very electronically driven. I mean, I got a laptop here with a TV and four other pieces of electronics here on the table alone. Um, terrorist attacks, we all know about those. Man-made disasters or accidents, civil unrest. We've got situations going on in Baltimore. We've got situations going on in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, McKinney, Texas is looking a little hairy. Anybody watch the news this morning? Yes. Dallas, Texas right now. we get got some crazy dude who boarded himself up in an armored vehicle. We don't know how much chaos that man could spread. Or maybe he's a result of what happened in McKinney. We don't know. The point is, is uncertainty happens when you're dealing with humans. And there's a few of us on this planet. Large-scale natural disasters. Earthquakes, San Madrid Fault, and super volcanoes are the ones I hear most people talk about. Um, honestly, I don't know much about any of them. But, uh, yeah. Zombie apocalypse. FEMA says that this is real, apparently. <laughs> so FEMA has actually a commercial which says, Be prepared in the event of a zombie apocalypse. It's just a thing about being prepared. Have yourself ready to go. You know, don't be sitting there living on the groceries you brought home from McDonald's that night. <coughs> and this stuff is a fan event, or SHTF, as we may commonly know. Other situations. Anybody have any other situations they want to throw out on this one? That they want to contribute for other people? Or did I cover most of the usual suspects? Well, when you're talking about your national, your, uh, national disasters, you're talking about hurricane here. Fair enough. Hurricane and floods. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, we had some rain the last few months. Yeah, like a whole month. Mm -hmm. you know. And then if you have your earthquake, I mean your <coughs> hurricane, which happened with uh, Katrina, mm -hmm. and you got the whole flood of people coming your way. Right. And that can also point into civil unrest, because if they start protesting for whatever reason, you know, their welfare checks or their FEMA grants or food stamp, whatever. I mean, plenty close enough to Houston. I had, I had friends in Baton Rouge that when, when um, that right. happened in New Orleans, within within 18 hours they had people breaking in in Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. They had already moved that quick. So we're plenty close enough that if something goes bad in Houston, we're, we're going to be affected. Right. Exactly. Right. A great example. Houston, we're almost considered the it's, greater Houston area. It's too big. It's going you know? to be here. Over and, there. Right, eventually what affects Houston will eventually get here. It may just take an extra day. Remember what happened with Ike. You know, we were the only area here that had electricity for weeks. Mm -hmm. And people were coming in here to buy the groceries and everything. And we're wiping out our, right. our supplies, too. 
So it may not even be an emergency in your area. Right. It may be an emergency in a, f a few hours away that actually is sucking the resources out of this area. And these are all great. I mean, these are very direct events. These are things that happen to you or your community directly. Some of these other ones <laughs> discussed here are outside the, the community, which affects the community. So that's something to be aware of. That's a, these are great examples right here. Hurricane Ike. And was that Hurricane Ike as well? Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. I didn't know about that. that like I said, I learned something out of the deal too. All right. So the meat and potatoes, the definition or description of a get-home bag is simply a bag or collection of items that will facilitate your survival and successful return <coughs> to your home or place of de your destination uh, from your location during a SHTF event when traveling by a vehicle is not possible for one reason or another. Um, I keep harping back to the EMP example. Electromagnetic pulse, your phones aren't going to work, your car is going to be a very big paperweight. Um, if you have an electric wheelchair, that's going <laughs> to not be electric anymore. Um, you know, electric doors, all that stuff's not going to work anymore. And that's going to be a problem for you. Sir? From what I've understood about EMP, um, it also destroys the, the device, right? It destroys certain parts of the device. Um, I do have a, a like a three minute video if you guys are interested in seeing it has some more information on the EMP. We can so we can kind of let me just uh, change over here real quick. I've come to White Sands Missile Range to see for myself what an EMP attack might actually do. This device creates the same electromagnetic pulse that's given off by a nuclear blast. The pulse doesn't affect people, only electronics. But just to be on the safe side, Russ and I retreat to a safe distance. Attention in the area, we'll now fire the EMP pulse for charging. Ten. This Nine. remote control helicopter Eight. is about to fly through an electric discharge of Six. close to a million volts. Five. And yet the Four. most sinister thing about it. Three. Is there's no flash, no bang. There you go. There you go. Excellent work. Excellent work. Man, in an instant, the helicopter circuitry is completely fried. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. One second you're in the air, next second you're on the ground. Not a good way to go through the day, especially if you're in an airplane. Let's go take a look at it. Flying along just like that. He's doing a great job. Next thing you know, just one little click. Click and boom, right out of the sky. For the ultimate test, I'm gonna put myself right into the line of fire by driving a vehicle through the pulse. The fuel tank has been specially prepared using pressurized nitrogen to prevent an explosion. Even so, this isn't exactly standard procedure. They've assured me that uh, when the pulse radiates that uh, the car will not explode. So I'd like to say to my family, I love you. And to the camera guys and uh, the cameras, they have to leave because they can't stay around for the shot. So let's see what happens. Attention in the area, we'll now fire the people start charging. Here we go. Five. Four. Get a little momentum. Three. Two. One. still alive. Uh, the car isn't. The car is officially dead. I heard the click of the switch. The pulse came through. Uh, fried out the uh, electronics uh, as far as the uh, starter switch. But there's still battery power. That's why the windows still work. They run basically very simply. You've got some lights on the dash, but when you try to go to the ignition, nothing really there. It just dies. Traveling at the speed of light, an EMP attack would strike everything directly in its line of sight. The higher the altitude, the greater the devastation. At 30 miles above the United States, the device would affect up to half a dozen states. But at 300 miles, the whole continent of North America would be brought to an irreversible standstill. So theoretically, old style tractors and things like that would still run. Yes, and that old, old style old vehicles, cars, with like the points distribute the points firing points. systems, um, 
as long as it's not computer reliant. Right. There are some facilities and some people online that will tell you you can buy a new computer for your car, keep it in a Faraday cage, bury it underground or what have you, and then as soon as it happens you just plug and play again. And I don't know if that would work. I'm not going to try and tell you it will or won't. But, but if you have an older car, you can't get gas for it unless you have gas cans. True, true but true. the pumps in the gas stations can be turned manually. I didn't know that. You can actually access the panel below the counter and everything, pull that out. There's actually a manual, you can do a manual crank on those. <laughs> Not that I'm going to tell anybody how to steal gas. There's going to be gas cans everywhere you look, too. Yeah, you know, yeah we got cars. a few. Plus, yeah, exactly. Yeah, cars yeah. are gas cans. Yeah. Okay, someone next door to you may only have the latest Toyota Prius. So all you need is a hose. All you yeah. need is a siphon. You know, you can barter with them. Okay, I've got a garden with some corn. Maybe they need corn. They don't need gas. You know. So in the Great Depression, there was examples of people trading a bag of potatoes for an entire car. So. Well, I believe that will happen. Bartering. Yeah, bartering is going to be a great thing to look yes. at in that situation. Mm -hmm. So the get home bag is. These are some basics that it's going to provide. Okay, uh, it's going to provide you food, water, safety, shelter, defenses, and um, other things. There's no cookie cutter example that I can give you that's going to solve all your problems. So you may have to add or subtract from this assemble, assembly as necessary. Um, anybody got any other examples of stuff that they might want to, like a general category type deal, something that might be important? Something medical in there. Yeah, medicine. I would. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that might be safety. Yeah. Stuff, you probably need to have them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, prescription medications. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I like about my vehicle is, is it came factory equipped with a first aid kit built into the back. So that's why I, just, I don't bother carrying a first aid kit in my get home bag because mm -hmm. if something happens like that, I'm taking that with me. All right. So the intention is to keep you alive and physically functional is basically what it boils down to. It's going to keep you healthy so you can reach home or some other location in the event of an emergency. This is not a long-term solution, okay? It's really built for three to five days at most is what I consider appropriate, okay? Honestly, here, if you live within the city limits of Bryan, it, you're talking five to seven miles at most from your house. If it takes you three days to traverse that, then you got other problems, okay? There's a lot more problems to deal with. But if you live, and I'm going to show this, something about this later. There was a book I read about a gentleman who, it, it, fiction, um, where he was, he used to travel for work a lot, and he was like 350 miles from home. It took him like two weeks to get home after a, an EMP caused coronal mass ejection. And it was a, it was a great book, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk, I'm going to show that book a little bit, or at least the cover, so you guys can read it later on, because it's a great, I, I took notes when I was reading this fiction book. So, anyway, um, so many of you may have heard of the bug out bag. Anybody heard of that before? FEMA talks about them. Have a, have a bug out bag ready to go so in the event of emergency. So here's the differences. The get home bag is intended for a predetermined event. It's a short term thing. It's I'm going to go from point A to point B. Okay, my car broke down. Whatever's happened, there's no way to drive really any further. I'm going to go from here to home. That's it. A bug out bag is intended for a more long term evacuation. For some reason, your home or place you're holed up in has become unsafe, uninhabitable, uh, for one reason or another, um, you're grabbing and leaving. You're not coming home again, anytime soon. Okay, this is a long-term get-out-of-dodge thing. I personally don't like the idea of a bug-out bag. I like having things ready to go if I have to evacuate. I don't like the idea of bugging out, because if you think about it, you've got all your infrastructure, you've got all your preparations, you've got all your food, medicines, uh, what clothing, Armory, thank you. You have all yes. that. I mean, someone who has 25, 30,000 rounds of ammunition, you're not picking that up, throwing a backpack, and running. And even if you get a vehicle, how far is that going to get you? So, now I'm going to get into a principle that some of you may never have heard of before. Uh, in talking with some of the people when I was preparing for this, uh, they really thought this was an amazing principle. And I do believe pictures mean more than a thousand words, so you'll see a few cool pictures, and you're even going to see a video on that. Uh, this is called the Gray Man Principle, and I'm not going to try and read all this. It is in your flyer. It's over a series of multiple slides. I'm just going to read a few of the key bullet points, which is, these are the bold ones, okay? The Gray Man is always invisible in plain sight, okay, blended into the surroundings. 
this is different in different areas. In New York, God help you, maybe you have to dress like a like a preppy liberal. Down here in Texas, <coughs> running around in camouflage is kind of like saying, okay, it's Tuesday. Okay? In New York, you run around in camouflage, you're either hunting, you're in the army, or you're dangerous. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking from experience on that one. Running around in camouflage down here, no big deal. Who cares? I got I come off a hunt off a hunt trip, had to stop at Walmart to get some you know, groceries on the way home, all I do is lock my gun in the car. Because <laughs> it was I had an open holster and I was wearing the camo I was wearing into Walmart. No one cared. No one cared. No one cared. So So the gray man never draws attention to himself by word, dress, actions, or mannerisms. We're gonna go into more of some of what that means, but military refers to this term as OPSEC, operational security. You don't tell, I mean, we all have neighbors, right? You don't let your neighbors know that you're building a nuclear bunker underneath your house to survive the zombie apocalypse, and then the zombies show up and you wonder why you're kicking your door in. Okay, that's just a blunt way of putting that one. So, <coughs> this boils down to the gray man is a private man about stuff like this. Okay? You want to be friends with your neighbor, be friends with your neighbors, fine. Okay, let's talk about the neighbor down the street who never cuts his lawn. Let's talk about the obnoxious kid who lives across the street and has a loud, obnoxious truck that runs down the street drag racing at 2 in the morning. You're not telling them about how many guns and ammo you got. I've got a get-home bag in my truck that I can survive six days if I have to get home with. i got this, that, and the other thing in the back room here. You don't tell them that kind of thing. We'll go, again, we'll go more into that in a minute, too. But that whole thing, I, t I literally copy and paste that from the website because I love the way it speaks. It speaks about not having the... the loud, obnoxious truck doing drag racing at 2 in the morning. We're in Texas, you're going to drive a truck. Okay? A Prius, if you live in New York, you drive a Prius. Blend in with people. If you're in San Francisco, where, where was it, Long Beach? Mm -hmm. You drive a Prius to blend in. Okay? But you have a truck still. So, because you need to beat something, you know, you need something that can take a beating. So, or worse, I think I heard. <laughs> yep. So, the gray man principle, to me, is the most important rule for staying alive. Okay, you can if if you can just walk through a crowd of people and people not even consider you as important, <coughs> that's probably the best option you've got. Honestly, this young lady right here probably has has that skill perfect, because no one in here is going to sit there and say this young lady here is a threat to us. No one's going to think she's prepared out of the wazoo to survive the zombie apocalypse. They're just going to think this is a this is a nice little old lady who's, you know, reminds me of my grandma. You know, I'm not going to think her a threat. She pulls a gun on me. Oh, shoot. I'm screwed. So that's the kind of example that um, I'll, leave, I'll give you with. Blending in. Again, like we've talked about, this changes based upon where you're at. Blending in in Texas looks different from New York from Maine, from Wisconsin, Minnesota, so you just got to do it for the area. Start now. Operational security. You're not telling your neighbors and your, your relatives, I mean friends, you know, that you're going to rely upon in an event like that, that's one thing. But your next door neighbor, unless you're going to rely upon him in an event like that and you're going to expect backup from him, he's going to expect backup from you. It might be best just to let, leave him off the distribution list of that email. So, and then obviously when the stuff hits the fan, it's too late. Okay, if you're, they got that new Walmart over 2018. So if you're in there and there's a guy who lives on Jaguar right there, and you're talking to him about how many guns you've got, that little stretch of Jaguar is a rough neighborhood. Okay. You don't want to advertise to him, I got 27 rifles, I got 14 handguns, I got enough ammunition to feed all of them until the end of time. Because guess who he's coming for first? That's just plain simple. So okay, that's when you thin the herd out. <laughs> True, that's when you line the zombies up and get rid of them all. But you laugh, I, man, I got my, I make both my neighbors, like, y'all need to start saving stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the first place I'm going shopping. And if you have, and if you have, Neighbors that you can rely on, and you can say, start saving stuff and preparing stuff, that's great. But if you've got neighbors, some neighbors will think you're completely crazy. Mm -hmm. Some neighbors will think that, oh, this guy's smart. He's the only one smart in the neighborhood. I've had a lot so. of people think that I'm really strange. 
because I do a lot of canning. I'm one of them. Yes, he is. <laughs> well, we know you are. <laughs> well, Jake is strange all around anyway, so. So the gray man principle, standing out is bad. And these pictures here, like I said, are pictures worth more than a thousand words. So you get the pile of black rocks and the one white rock right there. Okay? I had a drill sergeant in the army who used to say, I stick out like a brother at a clan meeting. And this dude, he was a black guy. So his point was this sore thumb right there. Um, and then obviously you have the one fox and the group of beagles. So he's blending in. That fox is like, I'm just going with the herd and don't nobody see him here. Let's just point it out, usually. And I'll admit, that picture right there took me a minute to be like, what's so important? Oh! Where's the dog? No. Anyway. Um, so now we're going to watch a video. The Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters. The very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. So... That video shows the point, like, he walked past thousands of people in that 10-second period. And, like, Morpheus was saying in that, in that scene, doctors, lawyers, cops, all those people, he didn't, he couldn't, they could have said, you walk past this woman 45 times, here's it on camera. But if he didn't notice, he, I didn't notice I walked past her 45 times. But the woman in the red dress, he's going to be like, okay, she's blonde, she's this tall, she get, you know, her dress, the little frilly thing here, you know. He can see details about her because she stood out. And then ultimately she stood out and she turned out to be a threat. So um, so that's an example of almost a great man in reverse principle because you're standing out to draw the attention to be a threat to that person. But, um, so that's a, but that's an example of we're blending into the crowd. Keanu Reeves, Morpheus didn't know anything about any of those people that walked by because they all were the same thing. They all blended in. No. Questions thus far? On the gray man principle? No? I think there's a couple more. Okay. So this is, these are the words actually that Morpheus said. I'm not going to read the whole thing. They're on a slide there for you too. Um, but it talks about how people are dependent upon the system because people become a part of it. Okay? And we're all part of the system whether we want to be or not. And being part of that system, you can, you're no longer perceived as a threat by the system. You all remember in the movie The Matrix where as soon as Neo's mind became unplugged from the Matrix. The machine grabbed a hold of him and was like, huh? And then it unplugged him and flushed him out of the system. He was a new variable in the system that it didn't want there. And it got rid of him. So what's going to happen if you stand out as away from the system, when the system has a problem, it's going to go for what's different. When I first moved into my house and I was speaking to my neighbors, my intention was to determine are these guys... Kool-Aid drinkers? Are they uh, the kind that is going to be more of a threat to me than anything else when problems occur? Or is this someone that I know that if, you know, if I know the chips are down, I can put my back to theirs and I know I don't have to worry about anything coming from that direction unless they're dead? You know, that kind of thing. And you got to kind of feel out where that person stands. And that's your own judgment call on that. I'm not saying to isolate yourselves from everybody else on planet Earth. Please don't take it that way. I am, when I'm speaking about blending in and not bringing people into the I'm talking about certain aspects. Okay, It's almost like you have to treat this as a separate part of your life because we all we prepare for emergencies, but God, I hope none of them happen. Okay, I'll be the first person to tell you, yeah, I'm preparing for, I prepare for an EMP to occur. But God help me, I do not want that to happen. So, planning to build a get-home bag. So you're sitting there, every, every, every journey takes a first step. But before you take that first step, you have to plan how to get there, right? So, travel. So, like I said, it's a predefined distance and event. So, where are you statistically going to be, and where are you trying to get to? So, 
Statistically speaking, if an event occurs, we're probably all going to be at work. Okay? We are the 40, we are the 47%, right? <laughs> so we're all going to be at work, statistically speaking, and we're trying to get home. Good, someone knew. <laughs> so you have to look at this trip. You have to map it out. Google Maps is a beautiful thing. Okay? Um, you have to look, are there predetermined problem areas in there? Maybe you have to travel, okay. I live here, I work here, and I know there's 25 different roads I can take to get home. Are there ones where there's a rough neighborhood? Maybe there's gang territory? So the Latin Kings and MS-13 have people in every single state. They say they've got 50,000 people in every single state. So, something to think about. Um, I know certain parts in this city there are rough neighborhoods. People who look like me don't want to walk in there. On the other side, there are parts where people who, you know, black people are not going to try and walk, especially at night. You know, so you got to take that into consideration. Um, Predetermined caches. So, like, let's say you live or you work in downtown Bryan, but you live 25 miles outside of Bryan. Maybe you have to put resupply points and safe spots throughout the location. So, okay, I know that if I can get to this storage facility where I have this itty bitty closet. Maybe it's a five by five you pay twenty dollars a month for, and I can get inside. You know, getting inside the gate even if the power's out, that's not exactly difficult. And then you just you know cut, put a pair of bolt cutters in your thing or your keys or whatever. You break the lock, get into your storage unit. Okay, I know I can close this door, board it up a little bit. I can hop, I can stay in this storage unit overnight and resupply, and then I can continue my traveling back home. Maybe you do something like that. Maybe you have a relative who lives between your work and your home, and you put two or three backpacks, or you put a resupply point there, and you know you can stay there for a day. Something to get out of the, get out of the line of sight of. Okay, there's some rough stuff going on over here. I'm gonna go hide here for a couple of days. Stuff like that. Um, so that's something you need to consider. Um, environmental concerns, naturally occurring and non-naturally occurring. So. Um, maybe you know that you have to cross a, maybe there's a, a bridge over a big river. Actually, there is on the way to your place, isn't there? Or no. you have to? No. So maybe you have to cross the Brazos River, okay? There's only so many locations where there's a bridge going across the Brazos River, right? So statistically speaking, those are choke points. That's a place waiting to get ambushed, okay? So maybe you have to consider, okay, that one there is too close to too many people. Maybe I go further south and grab that one. Okay, it may take me an extra day to get home, but statistically speaking, I'm going to avoid rougher areas, the possibility of ambush, etc. Or maybe you opt for finding a shallow spot on the Brazos River where you just put on, you, maybe you get some, you know, mud boots and you just kind of dredge across it. And, you know, of course, obviously, if it's flooding like it has been, you're not going to try and do that. So maybe that's the kind of thing. Or you pack waterproof bags and you swim across. I'm not trying to swim. I swim like a brick. So. You do a lot of things like a brick. I do. <laughs> Usually straight to the bottom. Um, and then what I would consider arguably the biggest factor you have to consider is human factor. People and gangs. So we talked about knowing your neighbors and how much you want to tell your neighbors. Your neighbors can turn on you in a heartbeat in a serious enough situation. The first person you may have to pull a gun on may be your neighbor. Okay? I'm not advocating that. I'm not going to tell anybody to do it. I'm simply stating that's something you need to consider. Gangs. Yes, we do have gangs in Bryan, Texas. Mm -hmm. okay? If anybody says otherwise, they're wrong. They're fooling themselves. They're fooling themselves. They're just, just not even willing to pay attention to reality. Um, I, I see the police reports on occasion where, yes, gang related gangs go into stores and rob stores. Or what have you. So, Maybe if you know where the gangs hang out, that's the place to avoid. So, this is an example of a root home. Okay? This is not where I work, this is not where I live. 300 Texas Avenue is actually the, the city hall of Bryan. And down here is a Wells Fargo bank over by that 2818 Walmart. I picked it because, as you can see, there's like three or four different routes that Google Map gives you. Okay? You can even go take up Texas and go to 21 and take it down to 2818 if you wanted to. Point is, is there's ways to get home 
but at the same time, there are areas to consider. Um, I've never been out on, was it Grouse, Grouseback? Grouseback. 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 I've never been out on that road. I don't know what that looks like. If I'm driving, if I'm trying to get, if that, that's my work and that's my home, I'm not going to try walking Grouseback because I've never been on it. I'll take a longer route because I know that route. Or maybe I know that one, one route is safer. Maybe I take 10 further down to Turkey Creek and cut across 2818. Bad idea, no, they don't. Maybe. I'm just, I'm just using that as an example. So, I'm just going to go ahead and X that one out for you right there. Don't do that one. No. Yeah. You're going to want to go 2018. Yeah, we didn't do roast bag either. Yeah. So my point is, is there's a bunch of different options <coughs> that are available. You're going to want to walk from east to the north. <laughs> just go around City of Bryan. Just well, go back to the one way all mostly commercial. You know? Yeah. And actually, commercial can be a good thing. Yeah, because there's not gonna, people go there and they'll there's, loot at first, but... But also, there's not going to be many people there. Yeah. Yeah, the first thing in a disaster, people aren't going to be, let's go get food. Let's, let's go get free stuff. Yeah. Well, let's and that can also, in, in my opinion, in a disaster where you're saying, i got to pull my get-home bag out of my trunk, mm -hmm. um, the first 72 hours is, in my opinion, the most crucial. Because mm -hmm. what's going to happen is, is people aren't going to be looting the, like, oh, can he go loot? People aren't going to do that. People are going to sit. People are going to sit at home and be like, oh, "This sucks. I can't play PlayStation." Well, they're going to be for the <laughs> first the day or so. Back on. Yes, yeah, that's my point. Working. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But people aren't going to. Most people are not going to say, "Oh, an EMP just happened." If the power goes out and your phone goes out and your car won't start all at the same time, let's look. Let's You're let's probably look. looking at a very like a single digit number of people who will realize what happened because there's no news. True. Media. You're not yes, going to find exactly. out exactly. And yeah. that's my point. People yeah. are not going to be like. Oh my god, EMP happened, let's go loot. They're going to be like, when's the power going to come back on? It sucks, I can't play PlayStation. And they're going to sit there for, I can't charge my phone back up because somehow my phone, which was at 100% five minutes ago, is now dead. Yeah, but most people won't even know what had happened. No, that's, that's what no he's saying. There's no way of finding out through they won't know television what happened. or anything. Because if you ask the average person, most people don't even know what you're talking about. I know Absolutely. That. And what I'm, I mean, if I'm, if I'm at work, and the power goes out, the first thing I, I'm going to do is I'm going to pull my cell phone out and look at my cell phone. Okay, my, power, my cell phone is down a brick. I'm going to go try and start my car. If my car don't start, I'm going to my boss, hey, I'm going home. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to foot. So anyway, so this is an example of, I mean, Google actually makes it stupid proof for you. You put in your work address, put in your home address, and it says, here's 28 different ways to get home. And I also tell people this, even though I don't do it because, frankly, it sucks to do it. Practice these routes. Okay? Well, you got to know them. Maybe on a Saturday afternoon, you have your, your girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, whatever, take you to work, drop you off with your bag. Okay? You don't even have to actually have your bag, your true bag. You can just have it weighs about the same. And just start walking home. Because you know what's going to happen is, is... You can't go from, I sit in an office, I run cable all day, I work in the office, I, even, even you, Matt, I know your job is very physical intensive. Walking home all of a sudden, not a good conversation to try and have, because you're going to be hurting within an hour. Oh, I'm looking for a bike. So, Rita, <laughs> let's just be honest. Some bolt cutters. Bike, whatever. So, and we'll get into more of the contents in a moment, but... You guys get the point. You want to practice what you're doing so that when you when it comes time to do it, you can do it. Well, the main thing is too, like folks like my wife, she lives on that iPhone and she can go anywhere. But you take that away and she can't. She's directionally dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to teach somebody Maps. to have some a compass. How sense do you of direction. A compass? Well, even if you don't, if you won't walk it, you could drive it. You know, and just go. Well, this, that, no, yeah, driving no, is one thing because no you can streets, actually see what's though. on the route. Yeah, you okay? can see the streets. Google Earth, though, you can go and do street view and be like, okay, mm -hmm. that store is kind of scary. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get killed if I walk past that door. There's a dog there. Yeah, you know that people have dogs in their yard. So, but my point of practicing it is, it's a physical conditioning thing. Because yeah. you can't live the average American lifestyle, which is sedentary, and then all of a sudden, this is seven miles if I you go Bruce back. Out to 2018, that's seven miles. Seven miles with a rucksack. That thing only weighs like 25, 30 pounds. That's a lot. Okay. Time, it's a lot. Yeah, after the first two or three miles, I'm going to be like, God, yeah. this sucks. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't carry bags a lot, and I go flounder getting a lot, and we'll just put a car battery, you know, in a backpack, mm -hmm. and we'll just do it for an hour. And it, after an hour, I mean, I'm in decent shape. It, I'm dead. 
for the next day. And a car I, battery weighs yeah. what? 15, 20 pounds? Yeah, I mean, we don't even use car batteries. We use a little uh, lawnmower batteries. But after an hour of doing that, mm -hmm. You know, it hurts your shoulders. And the average, and the average human on uneven terrain can traverse approximately two miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So theoretically, at seven miles, it should take me approximately traveling this route to do four hours, five hours maybe. If I'm carrying this pack, it's going to be something more along the lines of 10 to 12. So, yes. Uh, roll away luggage. It's got rollers on it, and off you go. So the problem I have with roll away luggage. Yeah, what, what's wrong with that? The rollers aren't that good. It's right across, better than hold on. Noise. Uh, you're Noise doesn't yeah. my asphalt. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> my shoes, I can walk on asphalt, I can walk on just about anything. Yeah. People in my office get you get upset because I'll walk into their office to, to talk to them about something <coughs> and they won't even know I'm there until I'm standing like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does that stuff. And people are like, Where'd you come from? You know? But if you're driving That or but you know what could work? Those baby carriers that have the big bicycle tires that you push up in front of you? It's got okay. a big baby in it. Hey, yeah, those are pretty quiet. Man, I've seen some, some ladies on my street running with them and they're So that's moving. another option there, yeah. right there. So That would be, because you know, I baby cannot runner. carry yeah. as far away as I live. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe for your it. option, that's a great that's a great option yeah. for you. So, <laughs> any, you know, anyway. All right. Well, that was nice animation. I know, isn't that? I love, I love me some PowerPoint animation. See, now it just kind of... It's kind of matrixy. Yeah. Actually called honeycomb. Anyway. Gear consideration. So, <coughs> the first one is going to be transporting what you're putting together. Okay? Um, I happen to like a pack. That's actually an image of that pack in a different color. What kind of pack do you want to wear? I happen to personally like the one with the hip waist belt because it does take a lot of the weight off your shoulders. Fanny pack. Granted, if you can get away with a fanny pack, get away with a fanny pack. I'm all for doing what works for you. So, uh, where and how do you transport it? For most people, this answer is going to be I'm going to leave it in the trunk of my car or in the cargo area of my SUV or in the back seat of my four door truck or if you have a toolbox in your pickup or if you carry a trailer to work all day. Those are going to be your typical places. Some people I know of have gone so far as to put a get-home bag at their office and just leave it. A uh, get-home bag in their trunk or their back of their SUV and leave it. So they have three or four get-home bags depending on what's happened or what the situation is. If you have multiple cars, I recommend putting one in each car that's the same contents basically. So no matter what, you have the same equipment to work with. And I never buy, I never use personal, personal thing. I'm not going to buy one type of item for one bag and a different type for another bag because I'm used to using this kind of equipment and I put this in one bag because that's my primary vehicle. That other bag's got something secondary that I'm not very familiar with. That can be a problem in the, in the field. Food and water. Um, heat, weight, and preparation considerations. So weight is an obvious answer. You're going to have to carry this crap. Heat, uh, or excuse me, uh, heat and preparation considerations are kind of the same. If you have to break out a stove to start a fire to cook something, what does that do? Adds weight. Adds weight. Time. Draws attention. Time, and it draws attention. Because nothing says come get me like the smell of something cooking over an open fire. <laughs> okay, because fires don't normally just randomly occur. They have to have something to start them. Peanut, actually, peanut butter, individual things and, and peanut butter, and peanut butter, but the peanut butter has a very strong smell. Yeah, that's true. So unless you're just basically, like, you can put it in a tube and squirt it in your mouth, uh, I tend to stay away from peanut butter personally because of that. Because peanut butter, you can smell that thing for miles. It seems like <laughs> you could smell peanut butter for miles. It seems like it. Oh, oh. damn, you got a good nose. <laughs> I mean, but you can like, like honestly, if I leave the jar open of peanut butter, within a few minutes, I'm sitting in the living room about 30, 40 feet away. I'm like, can I leave the jar open? Off the <laughs> you must put a macaw on your face. Cucumber. I'm like, yeah, my nose shit. Because <laughs> I smell that stuff, I'm like, ooh. If you open it up, he knows you'll open it. As soon as you open it up, he knows you, you have it open. Yeah, my dog hears the shh. My bird does. Chick -chick 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 -chick. My bird does. You open it up, he starts yeah. talking. So. Um, let's see, what, where were we? Uh, nutritional slash energy requirements. 
typical person and eat something like some stupid number of calories a day. I actually looked it up at one point and I forgot the number right this minute. But the human body only needs something like 2,200 to 2,800 to function on a, just a, on a normal daily operation. In our society, we have plenty of those. So the average person actually probably eats closer to double that in a day, especially if you go to like McDonald's or some of these fast food places. Um, but when you're doing this kind of activity, your caloric requirements are going to go up significantly. Okay? Um, I have had friends who have suggested vitamin supplements. Okay, oh, that's all well and good. I like to have food that actually tastes, which I actually think these taste pretty good myself, these MREs. Um, because there's a morale aspect to it. Okay? If you're in the field and you're trying to get home, the morale aspect of, wow, I just ate something that felt pretty good, can do a lot. Rather than, you know, this tasted great, you know, I feel better because I ate something that was good, you know, filling, tasted good. The difference in morale can literally change the course of battle or mean the difference between life and death. So, uh, water filtration. You, there's an old saying, what is it, you can live three weeks without food, three days without water, and what, three hours without shelter or something like that? Well, I happen to, I carry two different methods of water filtration myself, um, because water is something that literally can make or break any situation as well. So if you're trying to carry a rucksack cross country, or even seven miles, you're going to need a lot of water. And carrying water bottles is great and all, but it's impractical. Very heavy. Okay. Now, if you want to carry something like a camel pack full of water at all times, okay, great. You know, that's, that's cool and all. You're going to run out of that, too. So my suggestion is rather than trying to carry water, have a way to produce drinkable water. Okay? I happen to like the Lifesaver. It was developed by British Secret Service, or, um, excuse me, Special Operations, I, think, if I remember correctly. I saw a dude take water out of the Thames River, or the Thames River, however it's pronounced, puts like sewage in there and rabbit feces and all this other crap in there that I'm never going to drink or eat. And he just pumped that joker up and poured it out and that stuff was crystal clean. What was the name of that? The Lifesaver. Well, an important thing to take into consideration regarding water too is you need to include that on your, uh, your route when you're getting home. So if yeah. you have a significant difference distance you need to make sure that your route does go by some type of water, water source. Right, and one of the advantages of, and you're right, you're completely right, that is a consideration you can put into route planning. One of the things that the Lifesaver does, and this is why I happen to like it, is they include the sponge as part of their filtration. Now this is a solid matter filter, but it's also designed so if like you're walking down the street and there's a mud puddle, you can use the sponge to absorb the mud puddle and bring it into the thing and then you just put it back together and pump it up and that mud puddle may have just given you a cup of water. So that's something else to consider. But you're right, maybe you can walk through across the Brazos River and okay there you got a, a resupply point for water. So and just so if anybody's wanting to know that filter right there will produce six thousand liters of water. If I can drink six thousand liters of water in the eight hours it would take me to traverse that seven miles I apparently was dehydrated already. Can I ask a question about those? Go ahead. Do you have to clean them out or rinse them out every now and then? The filters? Or, yeah. No. Because, I mean, what if the water has a lot of sand or grit in it? Or, There's actually a solid filter in there, too. But, I mean, it, if you, I'm you talking muddy Brazos River type <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. water. No, no, right? Yeah, yeah. At some point, it's got to clog up. Yeah, it's no, got this is, this is actually going to, this actually will not clog the filter. I, I don't know how it works. I get what you're saying. You're saying you have to the clean amount, out something. There has to be something. You can, I mean, you can open it and pound the dirt out if well, you like. That's, that's going to filter. Particular it out. amount that's going to clog it up. That's what I'm. This thing filters down to 15 nanometers, which the smallest bacteria or the smallest virus known to man is like 25 nanometers. Yeah. Which is the polio virus. Um, if you want, we can pull the actual TED demonstration up later, where they talk about the technical specs of it. Because I, I have, when I saw the way that operated, I I fell in love. So well, what about the big straw things? Or That's things? one of these things right here. Yeah. That's yeah. a secondary option I carry as well. This is a whole lot more compact, more portable. Um, these things will work too. 
Uh, they actually don't, filter quite a bit. I don't know what the filtration rating on this is as far as nanometers is concerned, but um, I but, do know a lot of people swear by these as well. But I mean, you can do a lot of liters with them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's like 1,500 liters. Yeah. Is that one? Uh -huh. Did you buy that online or in a store? Oh, yeah. Or? Yeah, you can buy these on. These, I think you can you can probably buy at a store locally. They sell those at Gander Mountain. These guys right here? Uh, the different brand. Yeah. Them. These right here, uh, they're on Amazon. Uh, I think they're like 175 bucks for a, one kit. Now the filters you can buy a pack of three for like 125 bucks. So if each one can do 6,000 liters, you know, you get one with it, and then three more, that's 20. What is it? 24,000 liters. So you can bathe. <laughs> what's that? You, so you can bathe. bathe with that. I know, right? 24,000 liters, uh, a liter and a quarter close. They're not exact. So divide that by four. That's 6,000 gallons. The average human needs one gallon of water per day. So, yeah, that one there is going for one forty nine ninety five right now. The six thousand liter one. Yeah. Okay, so they've come down a little price. Even better, you can buy more. So. so we could use that. Yeah, all of those. You could use one of those and, and take care. A family of four. That's fifteen thousand. You can do fifteen hundred liters per 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 person. That's you know, if, if you divide fifteen hundred by four, someone do that. <coughs> quick. Fifteen hundred by four. 400. 400. 400. 400. 400 liters. So that's 400 uh, gallons per person. That's, so that's a four family of four. That's about 400 days. So it's a little over a year from one of those. 375. Okay. So 375. So you're talking just a little over a year for a family of four with one of those items. If you're just drinking from it. I'll just pour it over. Well, boiling water <coughs> is something else that, that won't always get everything out of. This will get particulate, but we can, like I said, we can pull up the TED video later if you want. It's a great video. What about the tablets? Tablets will treat for certain bacterial organisms. They won't filter out particulate matter or chemical matter. So if someone pours arsenic in there, oh. it won't necessarily filter that. It won't ki kill that because the part the tablets are a uh, basically a bacterial okay. or a viral side. Filter out arsenic. Some chemicals it will. I don't know that it'll filter arsenic. I was going to say, I ain't drinking Finn Feather Lake water. I was going to say, he's got to walk right by there, you know? <laughs> oh, I already know about that lake. So, they actually only have to fill, have to dredge that for like two more years. It's cumulative. You've got to drink it for a long time. They got a cool, like a uh, big. You're going to kill the bacteria. Down thing too. Well, they make, it's amazing. Goes in conjunction with that to fill up like four or five gallons. Oh, actually, I've seen that. It looks like you the jerry cans. Like the green military yeah, the green jerry cans. Yeah. So, I think you've lost their first. Clothing, footwear. I'm gonna come back to that because it's arguably the most important thing on this slide. Socks. <laughs> yes. And socks. That's on there too. Oh, definitely. Weather-related items. Um, we have two seasons here. We have hot and we have mildly cold, and that's about <laughs> it. That's it. Okay. And, and rain this year. We had a rain season. We had a rainy season. Um, if you if you think about it, honestly, I mean, I don't care about walking through rain a little bit. You know, even, even the thing we had <laughs> the last month and a half, I didn't. I wouldn't mind going out on that and walking for a few hours. But if you're in a place like if you're in Maine, for example, where you get 12 feet of snow, that's not hyperbole either, because they did get 10 feet of snow last year. Um, they actually were getting snow in late April. Um, you're going to have to prepare for that. Um, if you want to do a fire and forget get home bag, you're basically going to have to have the capacity of putting cold weather gear as well as standard weather gear in there alongside of it. So it's almost like you have to have two backpacks or some of these modular like hiking bags. You can have an add-on piece that this is my cold weather that I just put it in like in August and I take it back out in May. Something like that. Um, down here, weather related concerns are dying of heat stroke. So there's not a lot of clothing that can prevent that. So um, so that's that's something you have to design for yourself. And I'm going to get more into clothing in a little bit too. Because there's <coughs> thoughts that most people forget. So socks and footwear. You know, they say an army marches on its stomach, but it lives on its feet. All right. Um, I work in an office usually unless I'm working on a field site installing something and so I wear dress shoes. 
My suggestion with people is, is get a carabiner. Like everybody has these little carabiners they put their keys on. Don't use one of those. Go to like an outdoor store, buy a real one that like mountaineers use because they can actually hold weight. The little things people put their keys on, you know, five pounds of those things break. Um, what are you talking about? Yeah. The carabiners. You know, it's the little this. clip. I don't have one. Long this. look in has the thing that goes like that and snaps. Oh, yeah. Spring loaded. Yeah. Looks like a pretzel. They actually make exactly. real ones. Sometimes it's like the mountain climber. Yes. Yeah, yeah mountain oh. climbers use. Oh, okay. Get you a mountain climber style one. Okay. Tie your what the trick I I, I always I do with it is, is you take the laces, tie the laces together, and then carabiner it to the side of your pack. Because you know what, if I'm sitting in my office in my dress shirt and slacks, I'm losing those shoes. I'm putting on the boots. I don't care what I look like. Well, now, are the boots in your trunk or in your pack? They be with your pack. How about but like this, the better? Yeah. Okay. Yes. That yes. is a yes. fake one. Well, I know. Yeah. But yeah, like this, the better. Yes. That's yes. just a little clippy guy. Yes. So the the shoe, the boots, tie laces together, and I'm I'm carabinering them to the side of my pack mm -hmm. because if something goes down, I'm changing my boot into my boots, and I'm walking home like that. Maybe I'll save my dress shoes just in case you never know. But to barter. Yeah, there you go, barter. <laughs> Some may want to look fabulous. Um, so that offends me, sir. Oh, you'll get over it. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, so that socks. I believe in changing your your socks at least twice a day, especially if you're in a highly active environment. Foot rot, all that fun stuff. I got enough foot problems. I don't have to deal with that stuff too. Okay. So, like, I have two pairs of socks in this one because I don't anticipate taking more than a day to get home. Once I iron down all the other kinks on this guy, I'm going to actually turn it into about six pairs of socks. Plus, socks can be a very valuable barter item. Mm -hmm. If I'm around the corner from my house and I know I'm right there and I know I need, hey, this dude's trying to barter something, it wouldn't hurt to have an extra box of ammo or something. Mm -hmm. But then again, how much are your feet worth? A so, you lot. have to balance that. So, See, more animation. More gear consideration. Environmental shelter and pests. Um, I take that picture because it's kind of cool. It's, a, te it's a, a tent that actually attaches to the back of an SUV. I love that. I think it's great. They used to sell an SUV that came with that. I don't remember what it They're was. all considered optional. Is that Aztec? Yeah. That, that Outback Aztec? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, you buy it and it just came with it. You put it on. That was pretty neat looking. That's like the, this thing here, I've looked at the video on how it's, built, how it's put together. Um, pests. Okay, um, biggest pest we got to deal with is these things like, I call them pterodactyls, everybody else calls them mosquitoes. Um, if you're going to put a shelter up to protect yourself from that, I mean, honestly, you can do just as good with a mosquito net as you can do with a tent. Um, <coughs> for our purposes, if you live in Bryan, work in Bryan, you're not going to probably need a tent. This is something if you live 500 miles away, you may need it. Because I have to camp for a, few, a day or two here or there. Um, lowest profile that you can do is the better because you don't want to draw attention to yourself. If you have to put up a tent while you're traveling, let's say you're walking down Highway 6, my suggestion is you get off into the tree line, go in at least 30 to 50 feet minimum. Okay, to get Because people are creatures of habit. And if they have to immigrate out of an area to get to another area, they're going to follow major highways, they're going to follow roads. Stay out of people's sight. Okay? You can blend right in the tree line and now you're a green man instead of a gray man. And the liberals will love that, right? Uh, defense. Firearm. Ammunition. Uh, how much you need. This varies by your distance and your training. So, firearms. I am a big advocate of CHLs. And I even put specially in your slides. I suggest you get your CHL now because two things. One. You're going to have your gun available when this happens. Don't A gun does not do a damn bit of good if it's at home and you're at work. A gun does not do a damn bit of good if it has no ammo. They call that a paperweight. That's why when I, you know, when I built mine, I put a couple extra boxes of ammo and, a couple, and an extra mag or two in there. I always believe in doubling up. You say, well, I only need 50 rounds. Yeah, no, double that at least. Um, Two is one, one is none is, an amount, is a statement the military uses. So if you've got two magazines for your firearm, in addition to the one inside your magazine, you basically have two magazines. Because you've got three magazines, you actually only have two in my opinion. So 
You can never, in my opinion, defense is very important. Can I so. ask? I had a big debate with myself about that. And I said, that would have been entertaining. Please tell well, me it's on YouTube. For Did days, you <laughs> this is true. I had this bug out pack thing. It's like, well, if the EMT comes and we're at home and I need to go to Brian and walk and get supplies. But I sat there for days going, okay, here I got a 45, a 9 millimeter, whatever. And I finally made a choice and I said, I'm going to take my 22 Magnum pistol because I can get three times the ammo in there with half the weight. Okay, we're not going to start the 9 millimeter but versus I just, 45 uh, It was a long today. debate is what I'm trying to tell it, you. Yeah. Because I know two boxes like that weighs a lot. Um, anyway, so if you have your gun on, and also even if you don't have your CHL, I encourage you to carry it in your vehicle, like this gentleman said. Because again, if you're going to have your bug out be your <coughs> bag in your vehicle, you need to have that accessible so that you can say, okay, time to go. And if it all goes bad, like you said, it ain't going to matter if we go. Yeah. CHOs cease to exist the second something like that happens. Yes. Because their computers are going to be paperweights. Um, but I always encourage people to get training. Okay? I do not like it when people say, well, I got my wife or my girlfriend a gun and I didn't give her any training. Okay, great. Did you get her a class, an NRA trainer for training class? No. Did you show her how to use the gun? No. Did you show her how to take the gun down and clean it? No. Okay, so you just basically gave her something to kill herself with. I don't care if you can hand someone a gun and they shoot better than you. They should. They still need the training. So you have to also consider the uses of it. Okay, is the bullet worth the trouble? I like to say. Okay, because if I, and I'm going to get into this when I in a section I call the use of force in this scenario. If I fire a gun, it does two things. One, it depletes my resource, and two, it gives away my position and some of my resources to everybody. It advertises I have a gun. I have ammo for it. I've just used it, here I am. But also, it may also say, and he will use it. Right. And we're going to talk about that as well in a minute, too. So, uh, you can use, there are alternatives. Knives. I don't recommend knives as a weapon or defense because it takes a lot more from a person to put a knife between someone's ribs and watch the lights go out than it does to pull a, pull a trigger. You, if, you, if, you, if you pull and use deadly force on somebody, I always recommend don't stop. They train cops, do not stop firing until the target is neutralized. Do not stop whatever defensive action you're going to use until the target is neutralized permanently. That's my opinion. I'm not going to tell you not to use it or to use it. Other options, clubs, mace, okay, mace, uh, stun guns. Stun guns may not work in an EMP though, it, though it is a simple electrical circuit using a 9 volt battery and a capacitor with an electrical conductor, so they may work, I don't know. Um, clubs, <coughs> um, I don't know if black, are blackjacks legal in Texas? Yes. The small sticks? Yeah. No, I don't think the sticks are, but the batons are. I don't think the actual, I think it's certain, there's a certain thing that's actually called a blackjack. That's what I'm saying, yeah. The one that's the actual blackjack, I don't think you can have that. Okay, so well, a baton. Small, no, 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 there's, there's no, one that's particularly called a blackjack. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a yeah, leather one with lead in it, about like that. Yeah. So, okay, so an yeah, they alternative, are, they are, all right, so an alternative then that would be legal is the cop baton. Okay, the, like the Nancy Kerrigan. Yeah. Okay, so the, something like that is legal. In this state, in New York, well, Louisville, Florida. nothing is. Man, we're nothing is legal. You're supposed to just give everything up. So, did you? I'm uh, sorry. Did you? Um, or, I just said Louisville Slugger. Yeah, Louisville Slugger. Um. So, skip thoughts. These are thoughts that people tend to miss when they're thinking about their gear. Okay. Um, patterns and designs yield into what the gear says. Okay. Again, this changes per region. If I'm walking down the street in camouflage in New York, like I said, people are like, oh, he's, a, he's scary. Uh, he's going to hunt. He's going to shoot something or something. <coughs> he's going to kill people. He's a mass murderer, etc. in New York. Here in Texas, nobody cares about camouflage. Okay? Like you said, you may get a compliment on the camouflage pattern. You probably will. Uh, your footwear. Um, if you're wearing a $200 pair of Nikes, we all know that certain places in the city, you're probably going to get jacked. Okay, so you have to consider what it says. Um, my favorite line is the last one there, functional versus cute. Uh, some people are like, well, that doesn't look good. 
this is a form follows function thing, okay? I don't That's care if your fashion style says that you need to have a, red, a brown belt with brown boots. I don't care what color your belt is. If an EMP has just gone off, I care about the fact that you're getting home. But you did say to blend in. Right. <laughs> not New York. Blending is not fashionable. Is not, you're not going to be fashionable. And, and honestly, high fashion is probably going to make you stick out. If you're too color coordinated, you're going to stick out. But if you're having to travel through Martin Luther King Street, wouldn't it make sense to have a two hundred dollar pair of Nikes? It might be. Oh, you become a target then. <laughs> well, yeah, because then they'll want to jack your shoes. Right, right items. But that would be blending in. That's true. Reebok has great army boots, army type boots. Okay. My husband and I both have a pair of those. We use them as our hiking boots. They're the most comfortable things. He even wears them to work. Okay. I mean, they're the most comfortable things in the world. So think of those. Okay. So like those. Reeboks. And I don't Nike them too. Uh, yeah, um, boots. Yeah. They yeah. have a zip. They have a you know they're, they. And, and don't buy a new side. pair of boots and use that for your go. Yes, break them in. Oh, break them yeah. in. Use shoes. Yes. And yeah. It's supposed to hurt. In this town, though, a design a Nike T-shirt might be just what you need. Yes. <laughs> okay. And, say, and that's a good okay, example. He had on a Nike T-shirt. Well, go find him. Well, no. Nike T-shirt would be. <laughs> Can you narrow down the, the guys wearing the Aggie t-shirts? Yeah, exactly. Like in, when you talk about seasons in the fall, definitely have a maroon out t-shirt in your going bag. And the yeah, summer, spring, not a, maybe not a t-shirt. Sure. 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 Okay, and that's, and that's a, or even an Aggie backpack maybe. Yeah. yeah and that's a great one. I'm referring to the, the t-shirt. I'm referring to the people who are like, well, these these flats don't complement my my pants to walk home in. Uh, the, no. Yeah, but high and the other thing, like the stilettos, <laughs> the stilettos yeah. I do. <laughs> that can be a defense mechanism. Yes, it is. Yes, it can. Good REI, you right? If you're, if you're going to try to be off the road and, and, <coughs> and this is another consideration. Hello. If, if you're beeping over if, here, if you're if you're going to have to camp out on, or if you're trying to walk through the woods rather than down the street, you need to consider that too. A bright north face, a bright REI. Is going to stand out too, so you have to consider that. And th these are all like you can't just say, "Okay, I'm going to get this because it's the best tent." You have to get this because the route I'm taking lends itself to function with that. So these, like, like that's what I said. This is a conversation to give you thoughts on where to go, how to build this. So you have to kind of take the whole scope together and make it work. Um, environmental considerations, terrain. Okay, how many here walked? In ten feet of snow, uphill both ways to school when they're. Oh growing yes, up. Oh, yeah. Okay. That was passed down from generations. Yeah, I did. So, I did. I walked a mile every day. And out in snow, I did. So the point is, you have to consider what kind of terrain, not just the route. Okay. Walking on pavement is different than walking on grass. You're going I mean, your boots are actually, you know, my feet are gonna hurt more after walking on asphalt for a while than then walking on grass. You bring up a valid point too. If you're walking on hot asphalt for extended periods, you can actually damage your soles on your boots. Mm -hmm. They'll melt. Okay. Yeah, the other thing is, a lot of times you think of a, a, a train track going through a rural area, it's a great way, but then a lot of people are scared to walk between the tracks because what if the train comes? We have plenty of time to go. Try walking along that sloped embankment in that gravel. It yeah. Never happen. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very good. Stuff to avoid might be part of your route it plan. And also plan multiple paths. <laughs> plan multiple paths that you know are safe because if I get to, I'm going to use Grossback as an example. I get to Grossback and maybe that neighborhood. Am I saying it wrong still? Yes. All right, let's Grossback. Right. Grossback. Okay. So I'm walking along Grossback, or I'm walking up to Grossback, and I get there, and maybe some a bunch of hoods have taken upon themselves to impose a toll on that street, which involves me giving up my gun. Okay, no. And I'm just going to go this way instead. Or, you know, and, I, and if you see a roadblock or something like that, or you see a barrier in the road, or you see something where there's a, not a clear line of sight on that road, mm -hmm. plan path B, or C, or D if need be. Uh, human considerations. Defensive, like I just said a moment ago, if you can't get a clear line of sight, bridges, overpasses, stay the hell away. Okay. Um, hoods can be neighborhoods or hoodlums. Okay. I use that just very generic there. Gray man principles. I always stress the gray man principle. 
blend in, hide, stay away, stay out of sight, out of mind. <coughs> right. Uh, let's see, look at all that cool animation. Whoa. What to avoid? <coughs> gear, uh, patterns, designs of gear. A great big bright North Face or REI backpack would be a great example. What the gear says. The gear can tell people things about you. If I'm walking down the street, I got a tactical vest on with a gun stuck right here, seven or eight magazines. They're going to say, okay, this guy's well armed. I want his stuff. Or they may say, this guy's well armed. I'm staying the hell away from him. That's what you hope. That's what you hope, but you can't rely on that. Hope is not a strategy. So you have to take into account that, okay, maybe I want to hide my guns a little bit, okay, even though CHLs don't mean anything at this point. So maybe I want to hide myself a little bit so I don't look. There's targets in both sides. There's the timid, weak, I'm not armed, not prepared target. There's the I'm well prepared, you want to steal my stuff target. So... Um, you have to look at both sides, and I like to find that sweet spot in the middle where, yeah, I'm well prepared, but you can't tell. Um, Non-essentials, luxury items. This is a double-edged sword, because like I said earlier, a nice hot meal that tastes good can really save your butt, because that morale boost can keep you going. But luxury items, um, I couldn't really think of any examples for this, but stuff like makeup, <laughs> Sorry, ladies, you can leave that stuff out. But sunscreen. Sunscreen? Oh, yes. That might be a good thing to add. Yes. Possibly, but I don't know that there's going to be a lot of call for it right away. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, non used items or food. Um, one thing we did always like to do when I was in the military was we always used to, these MREs, some of them have like lifesavers or Jolly Ranchers in them. People, uh, people consider them non-used or excessive. I consider them a morale thing. But if you're not going to eat tuna fish, why are you going to put tuna fish in there? Okay? Right. So that goes into pack what you will eat. I hate tuna fish. I'm not going to pack it, not going to eat it. These survivor shows talk about beans, rice, and tuna. No. No. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, I eat the rice and probably the beans, but not tuna, yeah. and I'm not going to live off that either. I'm going to pack, uh, I'm going to build a supply of food that's going to be palatable. Well, I won't feed you tuna then. So, yeah, don't. Gray man principle, uh, avoiding standing out, looking too ready or looking too timid slash weak. I mean, face it, uh, there's, there's, everybody seen American Sniper? Mm -hmm. There's three kinds of people in the world. There's the sheep, the sheep dog, and the wolves. Mm -hmm. So the wolves are going to pick on the sheep. The sheep dogs are going to protect the sheep. But the sheep dogs are also going to take down the wolves. So you're going to have the wolves that are going to be looking for the sheep mm -hmm. to take on and to, to dine upon. But then you're going to have the sheep dogs that everybody can be like, oh, well, we need to take him out to get to the sheep. But if you kind of look like I'm the rock that's in the middle of the pasture, <laughs> then people can avoid you. Then people won't know to mess with you. 